today I'm going to walk you through everything step by step if I would start a new Rise of Kingdoms account in 2024. From choosing your starting kingdom, best way to create your account, commander investments, equipment, gem spending, we are going to discuss everything all the way to Season of Conquest. It's going to be a long one, but a good one, so without further ado, let's go. Spartans! What is your profession? <laughs> Let's start by discussing choosing a good kingdom to start because you never want to create your account randomly on one of the kingdoms. What you need to do is finding yourself a good jumper project. Go to Rise of Kingdoms official discord and take a look at the upcoming jumper projects that fits your starting date. But just like kingdoms, you also don't want to join a random jumper project, you want to join one which has a high chance of success. Because creating a new account, joining a project, spending your precious time or even money just to migrate later is a pain. But how do we know if a starting project will succeed or not? Well, we can never know for sure because drama can happen in any kingdom or in any project. However, we can at least increase our chances. First, we need to go over the recruitment posts to see what they offer. You ideally want to team up with experienced players and spenders, but pretty much every single post say that, and it's not always true. So what you can do is joining to this code of that jumper project and just simply monitor. See how organized it is, are people active and chatting, does leadership having meetings with players, etc. And if you like what you see after a couple of days, that means that project has probably a higher chance of success compared to a random one. Once we decide our project, it is time to create our account slash character but again, we are going to follow a specific way. If you played Rise of Kingdoms before or still actively playing, you most likely have a random character that you have not logged in for 30 days or more. In that case, we want to use that existing inactive character to start our new one. Once you log into that old account, a new journey screen will pop up and if we create our new character through this screen, we will have a bunch of extra bonuses which will help us greatly in the first couple of days of our new kingdom. But what if you never played Rise of Kingdoms before or you don't have a character that's been inactive for at least 30 days? Well, in that case, you will either create your account the regular way or if the project that you join still has more than 30 days to start, you can simply create an account on a random server, just play it for a little bit and then log off. Don't touch that character for at least 30 days so it becomes inactive and then once your project starts after 30 plus days, you can use that inactive character to trigger that new journey screen. This is, at least to my knowledge, is the best way to create a new character in Rise of Kingdoms in 2024. Once our new character is created, we have two different options and the decision is very crucial. You can either jump or sleep. I will only briefly go over them because I have a dedicated video where I compare a sleeper account versus a jumper account. A jumper account means that you start in the latest kingdom with your project, you play regularly, but you don't go over city hall level 7 to not lose your beginner's teleport. Then after a certain number of days, it could be 8, 9, whatever your leadership will decide, every member of the whole project will jump aka migrate with beginner's teleport to the final kingdom. This way you will be ahead of everyone else that are starting in that destination kingdom. A sleeper account is quite different and it's my personal favorite. You start like a jumper account and play the same way until you get to city hall level 7. Once you reach city hall level 7, you don't stop. You just keep playing like it's your final kingdom. You upgrade power, upgrade your buildings. You don't care about beginner's teleport because here's what we're going to do. Once your project jumps to their final kingdom, you will stay in the first kingdom a couple of more days because you lost your beginner's teleport to jump. You will wait until your project's final kingdom, the kingdom they jumped, is open for migration and once it's open you will do a regular migration with one passport page. This way you are not limiting yourself to city hall level 7 meaning that you can push as much as you want, you will have a lot more time to explore your starting kingdom to collect villages and high to mid tier caves, you can complete new kingdom power up events like there are so many benefits of having a sleeper account instead of a jumper one. But the downside is, as I said, you will need a regular passport page to migrate to your final kingdom. This means you will either need to farm enough alliance credits to buy it for free, or you will need to spend 5 bucks on the new work bundle to get that one passport page. Another downside is, you will be left alone in the starting kingdom because after a couple of days, your project will be gone to their final kingdom and you will need to wait until that kingdom is open for migration. I think it takes around 10 days for a new kingdom to be open for migration, but let me know if I'm wrong. So far, we joined a good jumper project, we created our new character through the new journey screen, and instead of jumping, we followed the sleeper path and finally migrated to our final kingdom 
and met with our project members again. In this whole process, there is one more crucial thing that you need to do and it is starting another new character in the Final Kingdom once it's open. Because that new character will be your farm account in your Final Kingdom and you want to start working on it as soon as possible while your main account is still in the First Kingdom waiting for the final kingdom to be open for migration because let's be honest unless you're going to spend a lot of money you will need at least one farm account from now on there are a couple of major things that we need to decide which troop type or types are we going to focus and where we are going to spend our gems because based on your troop type you're going to invest on your commanders you're going to craft equipment chase materials blueprints or even armaments now when it comes to choosing your troop type in rise of kingdoms and i think it's going to be controversial but after playing this game for so long, I think you need to become a purist. If you don't know what a purist is, this means that you will only focus on commanders from one single troop type. Could be infantry, archers, cavalry, doesn't matter. But if you, let's say, run three marches, all three will be from the same troop type. Of course, in early game, this is not possible because we only have a limited number of commander options, but this should be our long-term goal. But why do I think that it is the better thing to do? Because there is a major downside. And the downside is you won't be able to play with the best commanders from other troop types. And on paper, your marches will be weaker. Let's say you are an infantry purist. This means you won't have Nevsky, Ho Chu Bing, Zhu Ge Liang, YSG, etc. Your field marches will only consist Prime CPO, Guan, Liu Che, Sargon, blah, blah, blah. I mean, don't get me wrong. All these commanders are great, but... When you start going up to 3, 4, even 5 marches, your options are very limited since you are a purist and every single march that you are going to use is going to be worse than the best march from another troop type. However, let me explain why I think becoming a purist is still way to go. Number one is you will get the maximum benefit from your civilization, your special troops, and the city skin buffs, which will greatly increase your total number of stats that your every single march will have. Even as a free-to-play or low spender, you will most likely have enough sculptures to expertise the latest generation commanders immediately because there will be months between the current and the later generation commanders for the same troop type. You will craft the same legendary equipment over and over again for all your marches, which will greatly increase the chances of getting a special talent on your legendary gear. Also, every single time you craft a piece of legendary, you can immediately put your existing epic piece into your second march, because most likely they're just going to use the same equipment. And here is a heavily overlooked benefit of being a purist. For example, on my last KBK, I've used Guan CPO, Ho Chu Bing Nevsky, Burika YSG, and oh my god, Ho Chu Bing Nevsky was in the fight and then already at red, retreating back to my city, and my Burika and Guayu marches were just walking to the action. Having all your marches at the same place at the same time to deal maximum amount of damage is, in my opinion, super crucial. So there are upsides and downsides of being a purist versus just investing the best commanders in the game, regardless of the troop type. Now, you might be asking, which troop type would you focus on? Well, that's a personal decision, and I will explain which troop that I will focus later in the video. First, let's discuss gem spending because it can make or break your account. In Rise of Kingdoms, there are a couple of major things that you should spend your gems on. Commander wheels, equipment events, T5, and VIP. Personally, tier 5 will be the last thing that I spend my gems on. The reason is most of us are field fighters. We are not rally leaders or we are not garrison leaders. This means you will be fighting on the field a lot and healing your troops all the time. And based on my experience, healing tier 5 units are just so damn expensive. And because of that, I wouldn't rush unlocking or training bunch of tier 5 units. Yes, it is good to have one tier 5 match for your main troop type, just so that you can use it in events such as Siroli, arms training, etc. I know it sounds a little bit stupid because obviously tier 5 is the ultimate goal when it comes to troops. However, unless you're a high spender or you are able to handle 4 or 5 farm accounts, which I certainly cannot. As I said, I wouldn't just spam my gems to unlock tier 5. Number one thing that I will spam my gems on would be VIP. At VIP 10, you start getting one legendary commander every single day. At 12, you get two. And once you hit VIP 14, you get three legendary commander sculptures every single day, which is an insane value. Because good commanders slash expertise commanders are the foundation of a strong Rise of Kingdoms account. Of course, if you happen to be in an alliance with a couple of veils, you will get a lot of VIP points for free, which means you can spend more gems on Wheel of Fortune and equipment events to grow your account a lot faster. But there is one crucial thing that you should keep in mind when it comes to spending your gems on VIP. You shouldn't just randomly spam your gems to work on your VIP level. Only spend gems if you are able to upgrade your VIP 
to the next level. Because if you don't, those gems for the time being are going to be wasted. So wait until you have enough gems to upgrade your VIP to the next level comfortably. And if that's the case, yes, you can spend your gems and go to the next level. But if not, hold on to your gems because in the meantime, there might be a gem spending event that is going to give you a lot of value. And don't forget the rule of thumb when it comes to gem spending in Rise of Kingdoms. If it's possible, you only want to spend your gems during more than gems event to get the absolute best value. After VIP, I would spin the Wheel of Fortune to either 10 or 100, depending on my interest of that Wheel of Fortune commander. Because if you guys don't know, spinning to 10 or 100 mathematically gives you the best value. And for equipment, I would spend majority of my gems on the Holy Nice Treasure, aka the Egg event. It is by far the best event in Rise of Kingdoms when it comes to collecting blueprints and also materials. Don't waste your gems on events like Esmeralda's Prayer. Instead, as I said, save them for better events like Holy Nas Treasure or even special holiday events. Hunt for History is also a great event and I would spend my gems just to reach floor 5 every single time for 8 legendary blueprint fragments. But if you want to, you can just keep saving your hammers every single time that event is live and once you reach 50 to 60 hammers, and then you can go all in to reach that floor 5 for 8 blueprint fragments without spending any gems. However, as I said, I will probably spend a little bit just to reach floor 5 every single time Hunt for History is live. Now let's talk about which troop type is the best to main or become a purist and my own personal choice. All three troop types in Rise of Kingdoms has its pros and cons. Infantry is slow, also the damage they deal is not as high as archers or cavalry, but infantry is amazing in early game. For starters, you have the best epic Sun Tzu, very strong gold key commander Charles Mattel, first wheel Richard, and even later in the game, almost all infantry commanders are great value for money investment, meaning that they are going to serve you really well even if you spend very low number of legendary commander sculptures. Guan, Scipio, Sargon, Luice, Gorgo, they all work great on the field with 190 or 380 sculpture investments, so infantry is a great value option for free to play and low spenders. Cavalry is definitely not slow, but they lack AoE damage, especially compared to archers. Most cavalry commanders are heavy single target damage dealers like Minamoto, Kao Kao, Nevsky, Ho Chu Bing, and lack of AoE is their main downside, however, they still do have some really good AoE commanders, such as XY, Joan of Arc. I don't really count William skill as an AoE because it's a rectangular shape, but as you can see, even the biggest downside of cavalry is not that big of a downside. They are the fastest troop type in the game, meaning that you can catch your enemies with ease and also you can easily run away from them. They deal insane amount of single target damage, they have the best free to play slash low spender civilization aka Germany and budget gear for cavalry is also really powerful. And lastly, we have archers. Similar to infantry, they are slow as hell and that's not even the biggest downside. The biggest downside is they get countered by the most popular troop type in Rise of Kingdoms, which is by no surprise, cavalry. And most archer marches are squishy so they get targeted quite fast, however, there are also major benefits of being an archer main. First, you are going to deal insane amount of AoE damage. Your civilization is by far the best fighting civilization in the game, which is Ottoman. It grants you march speed, extra HP and skill damage. Commanders are super versatile, meaning that you can pair pretty much all Archer Commanders with each other. Some pairs will of course will work better than the others, but overall, as I said, they are extremely versatile when it comes to pairing them together. And lastly, they apply a lot of debuffs, especially with the release of Prime Herman. Archers now have two different Poison Commanders. And overall, the choice is pretty obvious for most players. In my opinion, if you are going to heavily main or just become a purist in Rise of Kingdoms and you are trying to decide your troop type, your best bet is for sure cavalry. However, if I will start Rise of Kingdoms from scratch in 2024, my choice would be archers. And that's why I said earlier in the video, it is a personal decision because on my main account, I'm not choosing archers because I believe they are better than cavalry, no. But on my main account, I have eight expertise infantry commanders. I have six or seven expertise cavalry commanders, but I only have two expertise archers, which is Budika and YSG, which means I didn't get to play with commanders such as Zuge Liang, Henry, Nebu, you name it. I did have a lot of fun playing with my infantry or cavalry marches, but as I said, I only had one archer march, and even that one archer march had the worst gear compared to my other marches. So I wasn't even able to enjoy that one archer march, and on top of equipment, it also had the worst armaments. Also, there is another benefit of archers, which is a weird one. Archers 
are the least popular unit type in Rise of Kingdoms. And in every Zenith of Power that features a cavalry or an infantry city skin, it is a lot harder to win compared to a Zenith of Power with an archer city skin. Same goes for MG events. Always, I mean always, more people are going to apply for infantry or cavalry MGs rather than archer ones. So if you are an archer main, you will have a lot easier time during those events to fully refine your account. But as I said, archers would be my personal decision and for most people, cavalry is definitely going to be the way to go. One last thing before we finish the video, spending priorities. Let's be honest, many of us are spending some amount of money in Rise of Kingdoms, whether it's $10 a month or $10,000 a month. And we have a lot of different options when it comes to spending your money, but some are a lot. I mean, a lot better value purchases compared to others. So what purchases I would make if I was starting Rise of Kingdoms from scratch? And a quick disclaimer, if you're a Veil, Kraken or whatever, just buy anything you want. This section is mainly for low spenders and mid spenders. When it comes to purchasing and spending your gems, as I said, your general rule of thumb is making those purchases during a recharge event or some sort of a recharge event. As you know, now we have different type of recharge events and also spending your gems during more than gems event. But there are some purchases, especially pop-up bundles that doesn't count towards recharge events so you can purchase them anytime you want. Two pop-up bundles that I will buy every single time, Writer of History and the Vanguisher bundles. Both are five bucks and both have, in my opinion, insane value. Also, there will be some other pop-up bundles when you upgrade your city hall to a certain level or when you unlock a new troop tier. They're also really good value, but I wouldn't suggest purchasing them if you're a low spender, if you're a mid spender, yes, but a low spender, I don't think so. Because in Rise of Kingdoms, there are many other things that we need to purchase. One of them, and it is the best one-time purchase, Growth Fund. From this thing alone, you will get insane amount of gems. I would highly recommend regularly purchasing Monthly Gem Bundle and the Divine Inheritance. Both purchases will give you great value over the course of time. I also recommend purchasing the first and the second tier of the New World Bundle every single month as it gives you three passport pages in total for 15 bucks because let's be honest sooner or later you will migrate to a different kingdom and those passports will come handy and if you wonder why i only purchased the first and the second tier of the bundle because they give you the best value when it comes to number of passport pages if you go over the 10 dollar bundle the amount of money that you need to spend per one passport page is actually increasing which is insane so what i would do is every month i buy the five dollar one and the $10 one for three passport pages in total. Also, ironically, this is the only super value bundle that is worth purchasing in my opinion. It is a one-time bundle and there is a reason for that because the value is just so good. The bundle is King's Coronation that is definitely a great purchase for mid spenders. And once you're in Season of Conquest, Crystal Supply is a no-brainer and Crystal Quest is also a good one. Other than all of these, I think a 5111 Minamoto would be a decent value as well and that's it. You see, there are many things in Rise of Kingdoms that you can spend your money on, but in my opinion, these ones are definitely hands down the absolute best ones when it comes to value for money. Now let's recap the whole thing. Starting a new account or new character in Rise of Kingdoms in 2024. First, you are going to find a good jumper project to join. Once you've done that, you will create your account via new journey screen for extra bonuses. After that, you will start your new character on your project starting kingdom, then you will either jump or sleep. As I said, my personal favorite is a sleeper account rather than a jumper account. While your new main account is sleeping in the starting kingdom, you will create another new character in your jumper group's final kingdom and you will use that account as your farm account. Once the final kingdom is open for migration, you will bring your main account to that kingdom with one passport page. Then you will decide your main troop type as it will affect your commanders, equipment and armament investments. Because of all the reasons that I've explained earlier in the video, my choice will be cavalry. And when it comes to spending your gems, I will prioritize VIP, Wheel of Fortune and Holy Knight's Treasure and I wouldn't stress that much about unlocking T5 as soon as possible. In fact, I would probably only unlock the tier 5 for my main unit and save the rest of them for a zenith of power. Let's say I'm maining archers I unlock T5 archers and I keep the rest as T4 and when there is a Zenith of Power event that gives let's say 15% archer HP and then I do all my research and make a big push. Whew, it's finally over. Let me know in the comment section down below if I miss anything and if you guys like to see more comprehensive long guide slash videos like this and here is the video where I compare a sleeper account versus a jumper one. Make sure to tap on it and I see you there.